Um, this week, we're very happy to have Freddie Manners from San Diego, who is um, the winner of our annual Longest Abstract Award, and uh, will speak to us about iterated Cauchy shorts arguments and true complexity. So welcome, Freddie. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you for the, uh, the invitation to, to speak from far away. Um, yeah, so uh, I should... I didn't realize I'd won the award for the longest abstract. Um, I am the talk is attempting to to give some sort of summary of a, a roughly hundred page paper of, of a similar title. So um, I don't know if that also wins the the award for the longest paper being discussed. Um, I will try and make sure it doesn't win the award for the longest talk, although it may win the award for the longest number of slides. Anyway, I have no idea how this is going to go, but uh, basically, I, I threw lots of pictures at a um, at a presentation and. Uh, Hopefully it'll it'll give some flavor of what's going on, even if I don't get to uh, say things in as much detail as I'd like. Um, anyway, so I should uh, get going. So um, yeah, so uh, throughout this talk, I'll, I'll fix some abelian group that could probably be a fairly general abelian group, but I'm always going to assume it's uh, Z mod PZ or FP to the N according to your preferences. Um, but just to uh, just to be clear, I'm not really asserting that P is small and N is large, or, or that N is large or P is, P is large and N is small, or any of those. These parameters could be any sizes you want. So uh, everything I'm talking about encompasses both the cyclic group setting and the, uh, an FP to the N where, where P is small setting. Uh, everything is going to be applied equally. Um, so uh, yeah, so I should set the scene really by saying what I mean by, by iterated Cauchy-Schwartz, which is really the the, the theme. Um, so the archetypal example of uh, an argument that uh, is very useful and proceeds by many applications of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality uh, dates back to, to Tim Gower's proving Semmerides theorem with good bounds. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the statement that he proved, well, that the useful form of it would be something like uh, that the Gower's UK minus one norm controls k term arithmetic progressions. So if I have some subset of my favorite group um, and it's close to a constant function, constant density delta in the UK minus one norm, uh, then it has roughly the number of same number of uh, k term arithmetic progressions as this, this weighted density delta. Um, so that's very useful if you want to prove some radius theorem. And uh, the way it's proved is, is via a somewhat stronger statement, um, which is that if I can take any functions, not necessarily indicator functions or uh, densities, they could be any complex valued functions, uh, they're all pointwise bounded by one, um, then the sort of weighted KAP count by these functions, F1 up to F, FK, which is this, this quantity at the bottom, the sort of you know, natural generalization of counting K term progressions weighted by these functions, uh, this is controlled by the UK minus one norm of any one of the functions. Uh, in this, in the strong sense. So the uh, if one of these functions is small in the UK minus one norm, then this whole weighted count must show a lot of cancellation. Um, okay, and by sort of standard arguments that are not really what I want to talk about, if you know this lemma, then that allows you to prove this top lemma by some sort of telescoping thing. Um, so yeah, the sort of inequalities that I'm going to care about are ones of this form, where I have some uh, some multilinear average, such as this this multilinear average over k time progressions, and I want to bound it above by some other multilinear average. In this case, uh, the multilinear average, which is the definition of the Gauss norms, um, with some some exponent. Um, okay, so I will sort of take it as read that that everyone agrees that this is useful. Um, at this at this point, I'm not sure. I can assume that everyone thinks this is the most fascinating part of of the uh, the Gauss's proof of Semmerides theorem, um, but it's what I'm going to talk about anyway. So, uh, just to to recap how this goes. Um, the proof is by applying the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality k minus one times, um, and it's it's semi-obligatory to to show what this proof looks like uh, just to set the scene. Uh, in the case of three-term progressions, where it's the notation is a little less appalling. Um, so here's what I would do: I would I'd take this this weighted uh, multilinear average of three-term progressions, um, and then. First of all, I'll, I'll change variables. So um, convince yourself that that I can if I can count three term progressions using x x plus h and x plus two h, should be a y I think. Uh, then I can also do it using two z minus w z and w. Um, so it's just convenient. 
Uh, okay, and then I split this this multilinear average into two pieces. There's a bit that depends on W, which just has F3 in it. And then there's this other bit, uh, which also knows about Z. So I can move the Z average to the inside. Uh, and then I, I think of this as the dot product of this function and this function and apply Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, and I get something that looks like this. Um, and now because F3 is one bounded, I can just ignore this left-hand piece completely and focus on, on what's going on on this right-hand piece. Um, and if I get rid of the factor of a half for the moment and just, just extract this middle term uh, and then expand out the, the square, uh, then I hopefully get something that, that looks like this. Um, so there are, this average over Z is, is squared, so there's a Z1 and a Z2. Um, okay, and then I rearrange that again, and I notice that uh, the, the blue terms know about W now, but the green terms don't know about W, so I can move the W average to the inside. Uh, and then I do Cauchy-Schwartz again, um, in the same way as I did before, and I have now a squared average with Ws. And when I expand that out and change variables again, that turns out to be exactly the definition of the U2 norm. And so putting all that together, I've, I've proved the thing I wanted, which is that the left-hand side is at most the U2 norm of F1 to the power of four to the power of a quarter. Okay. Um, so maybe, maybe this is something people have seen before. You can wake up at this point. Um, so things I want to say about this, um, it's proof is very elementary, clearly. It's sort of just something you can write down um, and say maybe it's not in, intrinsically fascinating. Um, but the, I think there are sort of many times where I have some inequality of the form multilinear average less than or equal to other multilinear average that I would sort of, I would like to be able to prove or disprove. I mean, I just like to know if this is an inequality I can use. And I sort of believe that I should be able to do it by applying the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality many times. But this proof doesn't really tell me how to do that. I mean, I could look at this proof and extract in detail, you know, exactly how the argument goes in this case. Uh, but that doesn't give me much of a hint as to how to apply iterated Cauchy-Schwartz in other cases, apart from just basically trying everything, right? Just like seeing whenever you can do these steps and just spreading out like brute force, uh, look at every inequality you could possibly find and see if you, you get lucky, which is, is not satisfactory. Um, so just to keep things concrete, here are some examples of some inequalities that I might want to prove using iterated Cauchy-Schwartz, but at this point in the talk, I, I don't know how. Um, so the first one is, is something like, well, rather than counting K-term progressions, I'm interested in counting these bizarre linear configurations, which have sort of you know, three free variables and these six linear forms. Um, maybe the count of these things is controlled by the U2 norm in the same way that the count of three-term progressions is controlled by the U2 norm. Maybe that's true. If so, that would be very useful, especially if I wanted to count, uh, count these configurations living inside some set, um, if that's something you wanted to do. Um, for my second example, I want to look at an almost identical um, set of six linear forms and three variables. Uh, maybe I want to count these configurations instead. And the only difference is that I've changed the last random numbers that I put in the F6 term to these different random numbers. And, and otherwise, it's identical. Um, and just to give an example where uh, the right-hand side isn't the U2 norm, um, maybe suspend disbelief and, and imagine that I want to prove the following inequality. So uh, on the left-hand side, I'm going to put the U3 norm, which I've, I've written out the definition of in full here. I want to prove that, that that's bounded above by this strange sort of twisted U3 norm that I just invented. Um, so this is exactly the same as the U3 norm, except that uh, every time I sort of shift by A here, I'm instead going to shift by 3A in the first, in, in the X row, and by A in the, in the Y row. And similarly, when I shift by uh, by B in the second row, I actually make that a 3B. So I'm just, I'm multiplying some of these shifts by three uh, or any other number like 17 or 31 or something. Um, so again, this is sort of, I'd like to look at this inequality. Maybe this is something that came up in, in a proof that I wanted and say, is this true? And if it's true, can I prove it using iterated Cauchy-Schwartz? Uh, and currently I have no idea how to approach that. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the idea is really to, to look more carefully at the three-term progression proof and see if I can, can figure out what it's actually doing rather than just, just looking at lots and lots of symbols. Um, so um, there's an approach to this that um, the only 
uh, reference I've been able to find to this is is this one of the less famous blog, blog posts on Terry Tao's blog. Um, but I, I sort of find it hard to believe that's the, the true reference, but I haven't been able to find a different one. Uh, so this says, in order to understand what this, this Cauchy-Schwartz proof for three-term progressions is really doing, uh, you should think about the 100% the case. Um, so here's the statement that we're trying to, well, that we have proved. So uh, if I, the, the weighted count of three-term progressions is bounded above by this U2 norm of, of F1. Um, in the in the extreme 100% case, so these are all one-bounded functions, I can make them make everything as big as it possibly can be. Uh, this implies the following statement. If the left-hand side is one, then the right-hand side is at least one, but given that it can't be bigger than one, it has to be equal to one as well. Um, so this is this is the sort of 100% analog of this fact, or it's, it's a special case of this fact. Um, and now, well, if I set these Fs to be phase functions, um, so e to the two pi i fi or something for, for some, you know, take logarithms basically, uh, then this, this now starts looking like a functional equation, right? So the, this fact implies the following corollary. Suppose I have functions f1, f2, and f3 that satisfy this functional equation for all, all y and h in, uh, in my group, then f1 also satisfies this functional equation um, that, uh, that, yeah, this functional equation implies this functional equation. Um, and uh, this last functional equation is sort of interesting because this is telling me that the only solutions to this functional equation must have F1 being affine linear. Um, so this is a sort of much more conceptually understandable uh, sort of algebraic statement that I'm, I'm interested in studying solutions to this functional equation and, and seeing what I can say about F1 if it, if it obeys this, this three-term progression functional equation. Um, Okay, and certainly if this fact about functional equations was false, then this, this inequality could also certainly not be true because, because one implies the other. Um, okay, and I think it, it's sort of interesting to look at what would happen if you tried to prove this, this functional equation statement by itself without worrying about Cauchy-Schwartz or inequalities or any of that. Um, so here's how a proof might, might go. Um, let's start, I start with the original functional equation that. Uh, F1 and F2 and F3 satisfy this identity for all Y and H. I can again change variables to say that they satisfy this equation for, for all Z and W. Um, if I put F3 onto the other side, uh, just rearranging. So, okay, I can now notice that the, the right-hand side here doesn't depend on Z. Um, and that means the left-hand side doesn't depend on Z either. Uh, and that means the left-hand side for one value of z must equal the left-hand side for a different value of z. Um, so I get I get this equation that having one value of z, yeah, the left-hand side is is independent of z in the sense. Um, that's a, a a valid deduction. And then okay, now I can just rearrange again and move things onto different sides. And this time I notice that the right-hand side doesn't depend on w, and therefore the secretly the left-hand side doesn't depend on w either. Um, and that tells me that, you know, the left-hand side for one W is equal to the left-hand side for a different W. Uh, and then on further changing of variables, that's actually exactly the, the affine linear statement that I wanted in the first place. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is how one way I could prove this, this fact about functional equations very directly. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the way I've, uh, presented it, it's hopefully clear that this is completely isomorphic to the Cauchy-Schwartz proof that I, I gave earlier. This is exactly what the Cauchy-Schwartz proof is doing in this case. Um, and the, the steps where I say the right-hand side is independent of this, therefore so is the left-hand side. Um, so these two steps here, those are exactly the places in the other argument where I actually applied Cauchy-Schwartz rather than just rearranging things. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, I have the sort of correspondence between inequalities that I might like to prove and these statements about functional equations which might or might not be true. Um, if I have a Cauchy-Schwartz proof of the, the inequality, that gives me a sort of very elementary proof of the statement about functional equations. So the statement about functional equations, firstly, I should wonder whether it's true. And secondly, I have to wonder about whether I can prove it in this very nuts and bolts way. I mean, I'm, I'm not allowed for the purposes of these proofs to sort of apply some structure theorem that tells me about all the solutions to the first identity and then check whether they obey the second identity. That's sort of off limits. I, I have to have an incredibly elementary proof. Um, and uh, yeah, so the exponent I'll get in the final uh, inequality 
is related to the sort of number of times I apply Cauchy Schwartz, which is related to sort of the length, uh, in some sense, of this, this elementary argument that I've discovered. Um, so just to, to flag things up for the future, uh, I think this is sort of, it, it's a well-known fact that not every statement that is true has a bounded length proof. Um, so uh, that suggests that, that if you sort of use this correspondence, you can end up with quite long and complicated Cauchy-Schwartz proofs uh, whose length might sort of, you know, 10 to infinity as, as the, you range over some, some set of problems. Um, and that's sort of fairly natural in this setting because it might just take quite a long time to prove one functional equation identity from the other. Um, okay, so if I'm trying to prove one of these uh, inequalities that I just thought of, uh, here's the strategy. I, I write down the 100% version, the functional equation. Um, I decide whether it's true. I mean, if it's not true, I should probably stop because that means that the, the inequality isn't true either. Um, if it's true, then see if I can write down an elementary proof. Um, and uh, finally, if I found an elementary proof, then try and turn that into a, a Cauchy-Schwartz proof. Um, so of these steps, see if I can, can draw on this anyway. Um, so I think... Uh, this one I'm sort of going to be not frightened of because I think this is just algebra. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, determining whether one functional equation implies another functional equation is, I'd say, I'm that may be a hard problem. Maybe it's asking me to like compute some cohomology group or something, but like that's the thing that algebraists might know how to do. Um, and this thing I'm also going to be not frightened of because I think this is basically logic, right? I mean, I having decided that some statement is true, I'm then going to. Uh, try and see if I can prove it in some sort of first order system that I just invented. Um, and I don't know whether you can always do that or not, it depends on some you know, model theory nonsense or something. But again, that's something I'm willing to outsource to other people to decide whether this, uh, this functional equation statement is true or not. Um, and sort of really the focus of the rest of it is deciding when I can turn this into a Cauchy-Schwartz proof. Um, and this is actually where this slide sort of falls apart as a strategy because um, if I can uh, get back to being able to move slides. Um, I sort of completely lied when I said there was a correspondence between Cauchy-Schwartz proofs and elementary proofs. Um, most elementary proofs don't look like what you do when you apply Cauchy-Schwartz many times. There are sort of many more ways that you can prove things in an elementary way than just this sort of very rigid left-hand side is independent of variable, right-hand side is independent of variable sort of uh, sort of idea. So I could be in a situation where I found a nice elementary proof, but I have no idea how to turn it into a Cauchy-Schwartz proof, uh, and I'm I'm back to square one. Um, so just uh, oops, that didn't work. There we go. Uh, just to uh, give an example of this, so let's take the. Uh, oh, sorry. Not to give an example. So ways in which um, not all proofs are Cauchy-Schwartz proofs. So the, the, the argument I wrote down for three-time progressions, it had this property that it's, it only has one track, right? I, if I want to prove line n, the only thing I'm allowed to do is take line n minus one and do this trick to it, where I, I sort of duplicate things. Um, whereas in, in normal proofs, you're allowed to use line n minus two as well, and line n minus four, and, and various other lines. Um, so that's a sort of special feature of, of proofs that that look like Cauchy-Schwartz arguments, like Cauchy-Schwartz friendly proofs. Um, and just to give an idea of how terrible that is, um, it's possible I could have a Cauchy-Schwartz friendly proof that expression one is equal to expression two, and a, a separate Cauchy-Schwartz friendly proof that expression two is equal to expression three, and have no way of knowing that I have a Cauchy-Schwartz friendly proof that expression one equals expression three. I mean, the, the usual way that you combine these two statements to give this statement is just not a legal thing you can do by applying things that look like the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So, if, if this sort of proof that looked like Cauchy-Schwartz was some sort of logic, then it's a warped and twisted logic where equality is not transitive. Um, and that sort of seems deeply disturbing if we want to somehow take these proofs and, and use them for something. Um, so, okay, now I was going to give an example of uh, how this goes in practice for one of my inequalities. So remember, I, I wanted to prove this bizarre inequality that, that looks like U3 norm is less than equal to strange twisted U3 norm for reasons of my own. I don't actually have an application for this, by the way. I, mean, I think it, it's a natural statement for reasons we're about to see, but um, whatever. It's, it's one, the, the reason I'm showing it is that it's something I can 
prove more easily than some of the other statements. So it, it's a sort of model case. Um, so yeah, if I take this and turn it into a functional equation statement, um, it says, suppose that F satisfies this functional equation, uh, then it also satisfies this very similar functional equation with these, these extra twists in it. Um, and that statement is, uh, is true. So, so here's how I'm going to prove it. Um, so I'm going to look at the, the second derivative of F, the second discrete derivative, which is, is what all of these rows look like. So um, yeah, discrete derivative A, discrete derivative B of F. And the hypothesis is that as a function of A and B, this doesn't depend on X, right? So the, the hypothesis here precisely says that if I take this expression with X, then it's equal to this expression with Y for any X and Y. So, so this is a well-defined function of just A and B. Um, and the hypothesis also says that F is basically quadratic, right? So uh, this, in the same way that if this is zero, that means you're affine linear, this is sort of basically the definition of being quadratic, at least sort of for non-classical polynomials or something. Um, okay, but just for the purposes of the sketch, let's suppose that F is, is an honest quadratic polynomial of, of this shape, then this GAB function would look like two alpha AB. So this is some, some bilinear, this is the sort of what you get by doing the, uh, what is it, the polarization identity or something on this quadratic form and you get a bilinear form. Um, so yeah, uh, G, this G function that, that we get turns out to be bilinear in the usual sense. Um, and that means that it's also bilinear in the sense that if I have three on the left, I can move it to a three on the right. Uh, so this, the pre, if I apply this previous bilinearity, this sort of Z bilinearity uh, several times, then that gives me that, that I can also move scalar multiples by integers from the left to the right. Um, and, and this last statement is actually exactly what I wanted to prove that, that uh, yeah, this thing is exactly G of three AB and this thing is exactly G of A three B. Um, so, okay, this was not a very careful proof, but you could make this into a careful proof if you wanted to just, uh, and you can even make it into a terribly elementary proof where you just move these functional equations around and prove this by linearity identity and things. Uh, but that tells you that the, the functional equation statement is true and has an elementary proof. Um, but uh, if you then try and turn that into a Cauchy-Schwarz proof, it's, it's sort of not easy at all. Um, there's sort of, you want to apply this by linearity identity many times and combine the results and, and it all just sort of, nothing seems to work as you would like it to. So I sort of, I suspect that this is my reason for suspecting that the original inequality is true is because it corresponds to this true functional equation statement, but it's not straightforward to, to turn that into a Cauchy-Schwarz proof. Um, okay, I had some other examples. Let me see. So there was this thing with this uh, example two in my list, this strange six, uh, six term count uh, of configurations. Um, and when I turn this into a functional equation statement, you know, is it true that every solution to this functional equation has F1 being affine linear? Uh, the answer turns out to be no, uh, it's just not true. So uh, that saves some time. We don't have to bother proving the statement because it, it corresponds to a, a false functional equation in fact. So in other words, I can find a functional equation uh, solution where F1 is sort of quadratic or something. And you can write it down explicitly. Um, but in the, the first variant where I had different coefficients here, um, then this is now a true statement about functional equations. Um, and uh, it's not obvious how to find an elementary proof. I mean, most proofs that this is true would go via saying, well, I mean, F1 has to be at least quadratic and then look at all quadratic polynomials and see if they obey this condition. And if they do, then show that they were secretly linear after all. Um, but you can, if you try a little bit harder, come up with an elementary argument. Well, by elementary, I mean sort of, you know, step by step manipulating equations. Um, and it's sort of very similar to the, the kind of arguments that I showed in the, in the example three, which is the first example, um, where you sort of look at some, some second derivative and show that it's bilinear and then use the fact that it's bilinear to, to mess around for a little bit. Um, so, uh, but okay, as in the other case, it's even harder to see how to turn that into a, an argument that just uses Cauchy Schwartz type steps again and again. Um, okay, so the, the original hope that, that I can decide whether to, whether, how to prove these inequalities just by, by studying the, the functional equations and looking at their proofs, that doesn't seem to work. Um, but I mean, just because it's not obvious that there's a Cauchy-Schwartz friendly proof doesn't mean there isn't one. Um, so I think the sort of, the, the dream would be that, that maybe you can just do it anyway. Um, maybe it's the case that even given some horribly complicated proof that 
transparently doesn't have this, this sort of serial Cauchy Schwartz friendly structure, maybe I could sort of serialize it or something, right? Maybe I could sort of find a cunning way to embed like these parallel like proofs as a single serial proof by just sort of stacking things up or, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's at least plausible that, that you could invent some clever way of taking an arbitrary proof and turning it into a proof of the special form. Uh, I just say, I don't know how to do this. This is this is this is a dream, not a, a theorem. Um, but I think like if you could do this, this would be incredibly useful. That uh, you'd sort of we we'd never have to be afraid ever again of uh, whether we can prove something using Cauchy Schwartz because we just you know do the algebra, do the logic if necessary, and then run it through some machine and, and get a Cauchy Schwartz proof out. I mean that would be amazing. Um, but uh, Okay, when I say that, I should take care not to say things that are obviously false. So um, I think one, one example of, of a pitfall would be, uh, here's a true statement about functional equations. If a function is constant, uh, then it obeys this identity, f of a minus f of, uh, plus f of b minus f of a plus b is constant. That's, that's just sort of obvious. Uh, I can prove this in an elementary way. Um, but uh, the corresponding inequality statement is just horribly untrue. So. Um, uh, if I just naively turn this into an inequality, then, well, uh, it takes sort of my pen out. Uh, if I take F to be the indicator of some set where S is some free, then, then this is sort of size of S roughly, and, and this is, is zero. So this, this is clearly not true as a, as a statement about inequalities. So right, not all 100% statements give you sort of these 1% inequality statements. Um, but this actually turns out not to be a very big deal as long as we're we're relaxed about certain things. So um, here's what is true. Uh, if I take the expectation of f to the fourth and expand it out, I get this, this right-hand side with just four free variables. And then I can sort of do the triangle inequality and pull out one of them and uh, pull out, you know, do some changes of variables. So I guess c is now equal to a plus b plus t or something. Um, sorry, if I can get my pen again. Uh, so I'm doing some change of variables. Uh, and then doing the triangle inequality. And if I just define uh, f of t to be the translate of f by t, uh, then we do get back something that was almost what we wanted, except with this extra translate in. Um, that uh, there exists some translate just by averaging uh, such that the left-hand side is most the right-hand side, as long as we're willing to accommodate this, this translation by T. Um, so uh, this is sort of maybe not quite in the spirit of it, but for all applications I care about, translating functions is sort of essentially benign, that, that none of the original inequalities I, I looked at is going to be affected much if I replace F by translate of F. Um, so sort of up to that caveat, I can take this, this functional equation thing and, and turn it into an inequality. It just might not be the inequality I wanted originally. Um, but okay, so provided I'm willing to take translates of anything everywhere, wherever I want, um, my statement, my, my dream statement is not obviously false. It, it could theoretically be true. Um, okay, so as I said, this, this dream is just something I would, would love to be able to do, but it's not something I can do. Um, so the, the content of the talk that I'm meant to be giving is uh, that I can do this in some cases. So in, in all the cases actually that were listed in my examples, um, I can, even though the original um, sort of elementary proofs that I write down don't have this Cauchy-Schwartz type structure, I can find another proof that does. Uh, I can sort of do something in an ad hoc way where I, uh, I just, well, I'll, I'll try and give a sketch of it in a bit, um, to, to find some way of, of proving that functional equation statement and therefore the inequality uh, just using lots of applications of Cauchy-Schwartz. Um, so, okay, here was my example three. Uh, I want to prove that the U3 norm is bounded above by the strange twisted U3 norm. I think K used to be equal to three, but K is now an arbitrary integer. Um, and uh, this statement is true um, and has a nice exponent that's nicely bounded in terms of K. Uh, and you can prove this by, by multiple applications of Cauchy-Schwartz, if that's something you wanted to do. Um, for the other statements, uh, I should say what like the actual problem is that hovers over all this. So uh, there's a question of Gowers and Wolf um, from about 10 years ago. So uh, it's essentially the kinds of examples one and two I was talking about, but just in great generality. 
Um, so they asked, uh, if I have this sort of system, this multilinear average given by some, some linear forms, phi 1 up to phi k, uh, so this could be three APs or this six-term thing I wrote down or anything else, um, then when is this bounded above by, uh, when is this controlled by the US plus 1 norm? Um, and, uh, well, actually, here I've written controls polynomially well, but they were interested in just any kind of control, so, you know, some, some quantity that tends to... Uh, tends to zero in terms of some other quantity, uh, you know, some growth rate on the right-hand side. Um, yeah, so this is really just examples one and two on steroids. Um, so if you take this, this question and run it through the, the process that I've described, so you, you look at the corresponding functional equation, um, and then you do the algebra that says, when is this functional equation statement true? Uh, and it has a nice answer because it's just algebra, so you have to sort of do some multilinear algebra or something, uh, and it tells you that I think this is true. There's some subtlety going on here in the in, with non-classical polynomials, but, but this is basically true, um, that, that this happens if and only if tensor power of, of one of the forms is not in the span of tensor power of the other forms. Um, anyway, there's some condition. It's, it's not super important what it is. Um, it's just algebra. Uh, and then if you try and turn that into an inequality, not necessarily with polynomial bounds, this is also known, um, at least in, in sort of most regimes of N and P that people care about, uh, so there's a sort of huge amount of literature, which I won't have time to describe every paper in, in detail, but um, uh, yeah, so essentially for different choices of S and also depending on whether you care about cyclic groups, uh, where sort of P is large and N is one, or whether you care about the finite field case where P is fixed and N is large, um, then different cases were settled by, um, by different people sort of building up uh, over the years. Um, but uh, essentially up to some subtlety about what the statement actually says. Uh, all of these cases are now known as long as you only want qualitative control. Um, and the theorem here is that, uh, well, I can't quite do the original statement. There's some difficulty about whether one is in the span of the others or whether they're all really independent from each other. Um, so this is some sort of symmetric version of the, the original well, this is actually the original gauss wolf statement, but um, something more should be true, but I can only handle the symmetric case where none of them are in the span of any of the others. Uh, and then I have the, the gauss wolf bound. I have US plus one control, and I have it with polynomial quality, uh, and the proof is just by, by doing iterated Cauchy-Schwartz. So I can take that, uh, that argument I was talking about, the elementary argument in example one, and turn it into a, um, a Cauchy-Schwartz proof. Uh, okay, so I guess for the next however long, I should say something about how I can do that. So I, I don't have some grand machine that is able to just sort of automatically take in a proof and spit out something else. Um, but I, I do something else, so I, I have to make some, some slightly more ad hoc arguments um, to, uh, to make this happen. Uh, so the first step really is, is how am I going to reason, about, how am I going to describe what happens when you do Cauchy-Schwartz a very, very large number of times? So I've filled up already far more pages of your screen than you would like with explicit applications of Cauchy-Schwartz um, in, in sort of honest coordinates, um, but I can't really do that forever. So um, I need some sort of framework, some sort of language uh, for handling this sort of in a more automatic way. Um, I think a good motivation would be how would you how would you track this in your computer, right? Like if, if your computer can multiply matrices for you or something, how do, how would it keep track of doing Cauchy-Schwartz? Um, so anyway, here's here's the proposal. Uh, instead of looking at these explicit multilinear averages, I'm just gonna forget about what the functions are and forget about everything else, uh, and just keep track of sort of what I'm calling a diagram. So this is a, a diagram in the sense of category theory, I guess. Um, but essentially just each of these blobs is a, is a vector space over FP, like a small vector space. Um, and each of these arrows is like a linear map. Um, so this is a diagram in the category of vector spaces and linear maps. And on the right-hand side, I've, I've shown what the linear maps are. This is the linear map that sends, you know, YH to Y plus 2H, I guess. So this is this is sort of phi three or something. Um, so right, so any one of these multilinear averages, I can trivially translate, and this is just rephrasing, this is not doing anything, uh, as, as some sort of diagram of vector spaces. Um, and then, 
The, the question then is, what does the Cauchy Schwartz step look like? So um, in coordinates, I had to sort of change variables and then uh, do some, some Cauchy Schwartz thing where I, I sort of, instead of this ZW average, I have a Z1, Z2 W average. Um, this turns out to be sort of extremely nice. So uh, what's going on is that if I use these new coordinates, I'm sort of taking two copies of my original diagram that have to agree on W. So, so the thing I'm Cauchy Schwartzing out is this F3 of W, this is what's being eliminated. And I replace the original diagram with two copies constrained to, to be equal in the middle at W. Um, that's not actually a, a diagram of the original form, but I could make it a diagram of the original form by, by taking the sort of fiber product. So um, the, the new, the new um, vector space that I average over, this, this Z1, Z2, W thing, which is my, my FP3, uh, this is exactly the fiber product of this and this over the shared base of, of F3W. Um, okay, so, so Cauchy Schwartz steps correspond to, to, to fiber products. I guess I could have written that. Um, but um, it turns out to be hugely more convenient not to actually take this fiber product. So um, if you take the fiber product, you just end up with a, a you know, a multilinear average that looks like this. If I just leave it alone, um, I'm, I can just remember this diagram. So this diagram on the right is telling me, now I can always take the fiber products later, and that just corresponds to taking like the limit of this diagram in some, some general sense. Um, but sort of if I, if I remember this, this combinatorial picture, then that tells me not only what the, the linear forms are that I'm looking at, but also where they come from. So it's sort of hugely, hugely more useful to just keep track of this combinatorial picture. Um, and then at the end of the day, work out what linear forms I'm actually talking about. Um, so this, this is sort of thing I'm calling Cauchy-Schwartz diagrams. Um, that, and it really is just manipulating diagrams in the sense of category theory, or if you like sort of directed graphs and things, if you want to be less posh, but, but I have a, a directed graph with some linear maps attached to it. And now Cauchy-Schwartz is just this mirroring operation. Take one thing, and glue it to another copy of itself. So it's a sort of reflected sort of, um, yeah, take two copies joined around the middle. So that's what Cauchy-Schwartz looks like. Um, I guess, I mean, there's things to verify that if I just go around keeping track of these diagrams that I am, I do have enough data to figure out what Cauchy-Schwartz inequalities I'm talking about. That's sort of something I guess we're taking on faith at the moment, but you can work it out. It's sort of, it's just a question of checking some, some stuff. Um, Okay, uh, so okay, so if we did one Cauchy-Schwartz step, for example, the next Cauchy-Schwartz step in that argument would start looking like this. So now I'm taking two copies of this diagram joined at both of these. So this is F2 and this is also F2. And I'd have this picture and then I just have to show that this picture has, is basically the U2 norm in disguise. And, and that would be my argument. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start using these pictures and I hope it'll make at least some sense what they mean. Um, Okay, so that was what Cauchy-Schwartz means in terms of my picture. Uh, remember, I also had this argument where I, I used the triangle inequality, which is another inequality that I'm, I'm allowed to use. Uh, and this is also very useful. Um, and this is roughly means like changing variables, but in a restrictive way, right? I'm sort of choosing A, B, C, D to, to range over some subspace that I've chosen where, where C is equal to A plus B or something. Um, and this also has a very nice interpretation, it turns out, in terms of my diagrams. It looks like a sort of morphism of diagrams or a natural transformation. So uh, this, this thing on the right, this is my, uh, my ABCD. Um, so this thing here is, is the left-hand side. This thing here is, is the right-hand side. Um, and this is, some, this is some linear map uh, from the parameters of, of this average to the parameters of this average which sort of commutes, you know, this, this diagram, if I, if I write lots of identity maps in here, uh, then this whole diagram commutes. Um, this, this guy is being sent to zero. He can, he goes, we can forget about him. Um, but anyway, if I can find uh, one of these, these morphisms, these natural transformations, that encodes one of these, uh, these triangle inequality steps. So we won't actually see examples of these, I don't think, but um, that fits nicely into this, into this picture. Um, Okay, um, so 
if that's how I'm handling, you know, I've sort of abstractified my Cauchy Schwartz to just messing around with these diagrams. Um, how would I set about proving? So I should be able to give a, a bit of a sketch of how I would prove this theorem that no one cares about. And then uh, if you could prove this theorem that no one cares about, then with a lot more work, the sim similar ideas will, would prove the, the Gauss-Wolf true complexity bound uh, that people do care about. So that's that's why I'm telling you about this. Um, so um, yeah, so to explain how this argument goes, uh, so the, the, one, the one thing that we do know how to do, or we do understand very well uh, with Cauchy-Schwartz um, is this notion of Cauchy-Schwartz complexity. So uh, if you remember when we were originally doing Cauchy-Schwartz on three-term progressions, this should say 3AP, um, one way of thinking about why that argument works um, is the so-called sort of Cauchy-Schwartz complexity statement. So what it says is, okay, here here's my, my uh, tuples of, of three-term progressions. So this is indicating this is ranging over three-term progressions. I can specialize these variables so that I get a one here and a zero here, and I don't care what on, on the right. And I can give a different specialization of y and h. So here, y is one and h is minus a half or something to give me a one here, don't care, and a zero on the right. Um, and then if I have a specialization that kills f2 and a different specialization that kills f3, and they both have ones at f1, then sort of that's exactly, it turns out, the linear algebra you need to figure out that what you get when you do this argument is actually the U2 norm. So when I said at the end, like change variables, it's easy. Um, th this is really like how you would convince someone that you can do that change of variables. So um, finding these two, two specializations uh, shows you that, that you have well, Cauchy-Schwartz complexity one at F1, um, and then that, that gives you the U2 bound. Um, but yeah, the key idea was I'm going to restrict these parameters in two different ways. And one of the ways must knock out every other function by, by giving it a zero. So when I take the union of, of the indices that have zeros in the first way and the second way, that should be all of them that I don't care about. Um, okay, so this is just uh, this is, this is a classical thing of um, how to prove some instances. This doesn't prove everything, but it proves some cases uh, of, of the like easy cases of Gauss Wolf. Um, to prove my strange bilinear weird twisted three, you know, k times a statement, uh, it turns out that follows from a sort of modified version of, of Cauchy-Schwartz complexity. So now I have two functions that I care about. One is going to look like the, the f of x's and one's going to look like the f of y's. Um, and then I have a bunch of other forms that I don't care about. If I can find two specializations, uh, one of which has a bunch of, of zeros in some of the indices and one, the other has a bunch of zeros in the other indices, and one has a k here and a one here, and the other has a one here and a k here, then, I mean, I suppose I, yeah, so my two special indices are going to be given k1 and 1k, where k is this thing I'm multiplying by, like three or something. Um, and then all of the other ones have a, a zero in at least one of the specializations. Um, then, I mean, take it on faith, I promise, when you then just do Cauchy-Schwartz twice, um, that will give you exactly the, uh, the right-hand side that I wanted. So, the, the strategy here is I'm going to do something complicated. I'm going to build this complicated Cauchy-Schwartz diagram. Um, and then at the end of it, I'm going to find these two specializations, which is a bit like doing finding Cauchy-Schwartz complexity. Uh, and then I'm going to do Cauchy-Schwartz two more times, and, and then I'll be done. So uh, I think it's not obvious why on earth I'm doing this, but somehow these two specializations are keeping track of my two tensor modes, right? This is a sort of bilinear calculation. I'm trying to show that some uh, some bilinear function is equal to some other bilinear function. Um, and sort of this is keeping track of, of one of the tensor modes, and this is keeping track of the other tensor mode. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the A's live on, on this one, and the B's live on this one or something. So when I have my KA and my A and my, my B and my KB, uh, that's exactly what's going on. Um, so, OK, this is, this is a bit where it might get a little harder to follow. But um, so the, the starting configuration is, is this, these eight uh, linear forms. This is just the U2 norm, right? These, uh, um, this is the, the, the left-hand side, i.e. Uh, the U2 norm, uh, U3 norm, sorry. Uh, so the, the linear forms corresponding to the, the U3 norm are just these ones. Um, I, I can try and specialize these in various interesting ways. 
so my final diagram is going to look like a whole bunch of copies of this. And then I'm going to go around sort of specializing variables and trying to get zeros so that I can get rid of stuff. Um, so one thing I could do is I could set A and B to be zero and Y to be zero and X to be whatever it wants to be. And then I can get like all four of these things to be zero. Um, and I call that sort of equals because on the left-hand side, all of these four things are equal to each other. Um, alternatively, I could just sort of not set anything to zero very much and just not specialize. I guess here I'm specializing Y equals X. Um, and then I'm allowed any additive quadruple on the left-hand side and, and I don't care about the right-hand side. Um, but either way, this thing is a way of setting four of my forms that I want to be zero to, to zero. Uh, and then that works as long as the, the remaining forms either are all equal or have an, an additive quadruple. Um, okay, so here's how this is gonna go. Here's, here's my original uh, U3 uh, system of linear forms with the Xs and the Ys. Um, instead of this big diagram, I'm going to abbreviate it just so that the four X things live as little dots and the Y ones are just hidden there in the background. So to avoid running out of space, I'm going to abbreviate this picture as, as this picture. Um, so here I go, I'm, I'm doing Cauchy-Schwartz on these diagrams. I start off with one copy. This is my original copy. This is just the U3 norm. I do Cauchy-Schwartz to get two copies of it joined at this, at this vertex, whichever vertex that is. Uh, I do Cauchy-Schwartz again to get two copies of this. And I've drawn these differently, but they are the same. Um, and then finally, I'm going to Cauchy Schwartz in all three of, of these things. Um, oops, that's not good. Uh, I'm going to Cauchy Schwartz in all three of these things to get this picture. Uh, so this is just some complicated system of forms with like, you know, 16 times something uh, linear forms in this complicated diagram. Um, and then I'm going to find two specializations uh, of the variables, which had the properties that I originally claimed. So uh, here's what that looks like. Um, on each of these copies, I have a bunch of Ys that are hidden from view, right? The other four forms. And I'm going to specialize them either according to my plus scheme or according to my equal scheme. Um, and the key properties of this are, this is a three and this is a one. So here I'm handling the case K equals three. Uh, and this is a one and this is a three. So these are my special forms. Um, and then uh, what else? So in each position, I either have a plus on the top and an equals on the bottom, or I have an equals on the top and a plus on the bottom. And what that means is, is that all the hidden forms, all the Ys are set to zero in either this picture or this picture. So, so that condition is also satisfied. Um, all of the green ones that you can see uh, either zero in this picture or zero in this picture. So those also obey my, you have to be zero in one of the specializations thing. Um, and also um, when I've written a plus here, I had to have an additive quadruple living at the, um, at the, the incident for numbers. And so you can go away and check that like, it is true that uh, two plus one is equal to three plus zero. Uh, and it is true that minus two plus zero is equal to minus one plus minus one. And whenever I have an equals, then all the four things around that are indeed equal. Um, so this is sort of a bizarre way to do logic, but um, essentially what I'm doing here is building some sort of circuit um, where in one run of the circuit, I put pluses and equals. And in the other run of the circuit, I put pluses and equals the other way around. And what this circuit does is achieve some interesting computation where I get three times something on the left and one times something on the right, or one times something on the left and three times something on the right. So I'm sort of building this circuit that can multiply by three. Um, and then having done that, I then get to sort of do this specializations thing, which is, is keeping track of, of tensor algebra for me, um, and then do a couple of cauchy schwartzes and, and that proves the, the result I wanted. That's, uh, oops. Okay, um, that was for K equals three. For K larger than three, I, I don't have space on the screen to show the, the calculation, but basically I just start cauchy schwartzing more times uh, to divide this. So, you know, I got, I got this far before and then I reflect again and I get two copies and then I can reflect again and get four copies and so forth. Um, and then I have to play the same game where I turn this into some sort of circuit. And now maybe I could get like nine on the right and one on the, uh, so nine on the left and one on the right or one on the left and nine on the right by sort of suitable pluses and equals and, and other things. Um, 
So yeah, and, and then making this as large as you like, that, that proves this bilinearity statement, um, so on. And I mean, I won't say anything about this at all, but this is roughly the circuit you would need to build in order to prove the, the gauss wolf statement, even for six forms in three, in three variables. Um, and just for context, each of these things with an A written on it, I mean, I haven't explained any of this notation, but this is, uh, each one of those is code for one of these things of arbitrarily long length that we previously built. So this is really a huge circuit. Um, each of these individual components is code for a, a smaller circuit that I've, I've already described. And then you do this and you do some horrific assignment where you sort of keep track of how everything bolts together. Uh, and then that will have cauchy schwartz complexity one and, and that will answer the question. Um, so, okay, I'm very low on time and also don't have anything else particularly that I can say about that. Um, but yeah, so uh, closing remarks, um, in a way that's very hard to describe, but if you try and do it, eventually becomes intuitive. Um, what we're doing is encoding these proofs as these complicated circuits. So um, you, you build some diagram and then when you're trying to assign bits to other bits, uh, it's like you're trying to, to build a circuit to do arithmetic computations. And fortunately, that's sort of an intuitive thing, right? Like you can build a computer chip to multiply by seven. And that's basically exactly what we're doing uh, to answer this problem. Um, and the fact that we have to build this circuit using Cauchy-Schwartz means that it has this incredibly symmetric structure. Um, but that's sort of OK, because when I then later go around specializing variables, I'm not bound to make that symmetric. So it, it's sort of important that I build this very symmetric like general computer. And then I can program it later to sort of do any calculation that I want. Um, okay, and then finally, so okay, that, that answers the, the version of the Gauss Wolf question I stated. Uh, there's this full version of the Gauss Wolf question where one is not in the span of the others, the asymmetric version. Um, I don't know how to prove that. I, I did try uh, quite hard to, to make these methods extend there, and I, I couldn't do it. So I mean, if you're skeptical that my dream is complete rubbish, then maybe one place to look would be showing that, that the asymmetric gauss wolf question can't be done this way. I, I don't honestly believe that. I think it's just it requires more cunning than, than I've been able to throw at it. Um, if you don't believe that this, this dream of, of taking proofs in terms of mental inequalities is realistic, um, it, it might be realistic if instead of just applying Cauchy-Schwartz, you're also allowed to do other things. So uh, I sort of suspect that if you're allowed to use sort of regularity type methods or, or non-standard analysis or anything like that, then you could gen build a general machine for taking elementary proofs and turning them into inequalities. I mean, that wouldn't be as good as Cauchy-Schwartz proofs, but I think that would still be interesting. Um, and finally, if you don't believe in my dream of turning uh, proofs into inequalities, then I think a counterexample would also be incredibly interesting. It, it sort of tells you that there are two classes of of statements, ones like the ones I've given that can be proved just using Cauchy-Schwartz and other ones. And, and that sort of boundary between the two is, is something I have no idea what that should look like. I, mean, I don't even know what area of mathematics that corresponds to. Um, but I would, I would be happy if, if uh, we could find a, a, a counterexample to this general statement as well. Okay, and then I think I'm vastly over time, so I should, I should stop there.